Lee Pi LP2020. Is it any good? Short answer, not really. So what you just saw is uh, not something that every Lee Pi is going to do, but it's something that could very feasibly happen to any of them because of a flaw in the design. You see, the volume control stage of the Leapi LP2020A+, at least for a revision I've got from about a year ago, it has the volume potentiometer connected as the gain resistors for this here op-amp. And there is no external bypass for this volume potentiometer. And what that implies is, if this potentiometer, which generally in a $20 amplifier is not going to be of a very high quality, gets a bad connection inside, you're going to end up with an op-amp with an infinite gain. And that's, simply put, going to cause the entire thing to oscillate. Especially if you've got a weak power supply, it's going to start turning off and dimming the lights and so forth. Now there are a few ways you could work around the problem. You could just uh, remove this entire op-amp and bypass it. It is kind of unnecessary for the entire for the amplifier to function. But I'm, in the interest of fairness, not going to do that. I'm just going to slap a new one on there. And uh, I thought I'd do a few measurements on this thing using my distortion analyzer in order to get an idea about how this thing actually perform in its uh, stock uh, execution. Now I've done a couple of small minor modifications to this unit. Well, one, I've replaced this uh, capacitor which uh, is supposed to be a low ESR cap and I've uh, repasted the thermal paste on it since the thermal connection to this heatsink simply was non-existent on this one. The amplifier chip was mounted so at such an angle that it simply made no thermal connection and it's been resolded and messed with. But it's a mostly stock unit so it should perform as pretty much as any unit you would get straight off of eBay. So let's get to it. So with our new potentiometer installed, let's have a quick look at how the amplifier is actually constructed. Starting from the input, we go through a simple RC high pass filter to filter up the lowest noise, lowest frequency noise. The signal then goes straight into our potentiometer and this op amp making up our speaker destroying uh, volume control circuit. After that, it, the signal moves on to this switch, which is the switch to enable or disable the tone controls. If the tone controls are enabled, the signal goes back to this section here, which is just a tone amp, which is controlled by the treble and bass controls. If the tone controls are disabled, the signal simply travels to these two input capacitors and straight into the TA2020 amplifier chip which on the output goes through the pretty much uh, copy paste <laughs> from the datasheet output filter since this is a class D amplifier it requires a couple of coils and capacitors to filter out the PWM signal and make a usable analog sound wave and it also goes through this protection relay which is uh, driven through this I believe it's an under voltage protection circuit right here it turns off at about 9 volts on the power input side of things we can spot a couple of nasty design well poor design decisions in this, in this thing uh, for starters the DC plug which goes through a filter coil but it's directly connected to this capacitor and only after the capacitor is the power switch which is not board mounted but mounted through these thin little wires 
But that means that if you accidentally hook this up to something with the wrong polarity, it doesn't matter if it's on or off, this cap is going to go either way. So you better watch out for that and make sure you, your plug is in the correct polarity. After going through the switch and uh, 22,000 microfarad 16 volt capacitor, the power goes to this 470 microfarad 16 volt capacitor and then into the ship. Looking at the backside and connectors of this unit, it's immediately obvious that the two inputs are just wound up straight up in parallel, so you can't connect two things to this unit at once, or they are going to try and drive each other, and it's going to get pretty nasty. If you were to hook one of these up to some kind of power amplifier, say a car stereo, to get some signal out of it, you could potentially blow something you hook to this part, so that's worth taking note of. As for the speaker output, this is a bridge mode amplifier. Since it's running off 12 volts, you gain a quite a bit of power output by running it in bridge mode, essentially having two amplifiers per channel. But that also means that uh, these grounds are not the same for both speakers. So trying to run a speaker between here and ground is just going to give you about 6 volts of DC offset into your speaker. So you need to connect your speakers between the positive and negative terminals for each channel. As for the quality of the printed circuit board itself, it's decent. Up here you can spot my linear to logarithmic potentiometer modifications because I didn't want to use a cheap logarithmic potentiometer. Those are not factory installed bodge resistors. And this unit has received some resoldering work by me since I have used it personally. The quality of the solder joints are generally okay, nothing too much to complain about. The board has a through plated holes and it's a dual layer board, so you shouldn't expect much problem with the solder joints unless they are they haven't been heated through properly, which is kind of the case with the DC plug on this unit. You can see that there is a hole in that solder joint. It appears there has been some kind of bubble or something in the manufacturing process, but the joint is still good. Overall, the soldering quality is very good for the money. As for the outside and the feel of the unit, it's made out of pretty good quality extruded aluminium with standard issue end plates it's got some bullshit numbers written on, written on top of it you're not going to get this and the knobs and buttons feel well, they feel like a $20 piece of audio gear the knobs are shiny and glossy and you really don't get very good grip on them trying to adjust the volume by sliding your thumb over it is not a very successful endeavour same goes for the tone controls which are slightly heavier to turn the tone control button well it feels like a cheap toggle switch I, <laughs> I wouldn't expect this to work for very long it's got that very kind of cheapy scratchy switch feel to it. Using the unit is kind of annoying since it doesn't come with any rubber feet so unless you screw it onto onto the board you're going to have to grab it to turn it on and off and adjust the volume or is it just going to slide all over the place but you can get this cheap little rubber feet that just glue onto the bottom, so that's not a big problem, but it's going to add another couple of bucks to your price. Now, I told you that the 20 watt figure on this amplifier is bullshit, so that leads us to the question of me justifying why I would say that. So I have done a little hookup here with the Leapi having wires going all over the shop. For starters, 
the DC input is hooked up to a regulated DC power supply which can supply up to 4 amps of current I've set it to 12 volts which is a fairly typical voltage you'd get in a normal application the amplifier will run up to maybe 15 volts but uh, I don't think too many people are actually going to run it at that high voltage so 12 volts is uh, a lot closer to what you'd actually find in the real world after that the amplifier is hooked up to my switchable 84 or 8 ohm power resistor which will just uh, load the amplifier down I can switch the impedance and turn it on and off and also from the speaker output we're going through a switch box to switch between the right and left channels into my distortion analyzer this is a device which will feed a signal to the LiPi and it will then take the output signal coming out of the LiPi and essentially subtract the signal that uh, it fed to it and measure everything else and an ideal amplifier will not add or subtract anything from a signal so what remains after it's subtracted what it puts into it is the distortion product or THD plus N of the amplifier so this device will give us a fair idea about uh, how this amplifier performs yes there are more advanced measurements you can take like IMD and so forth but I don't have the gear necessary to do such measurements I'm afraid and THD plus N will give us a fair understanding of the amplifier enough to make a justifiable decision when making a purchase also running from the output of the amplifier is my multimeter hooked up to measure AC volts and the fre frequency and from the monitor output of the distortion analyzer we have an oscilloscope this will show us the wa distortion waveform uh, in essence uh, this will show what the amplifier is putting out that isn't being put into it so I've set my the signal generator in the distortion analyzer to put out a 1 kilohertz uh, 0 dBU or 0.775 volt signal to the Li Pi and I've adjusted the Li Pi which is down here to put out about 5 volts or 3 watts or so into an 8 ohm load and 8 ohms is what your average uh, home speaker is car speakers are generally 4 ohms and we'll be testing those as well so let's on the display of the distortion meter we can see that it's set to 0.1% distortion full scale that means that when you the arrow is here you get to, you have 0.1% distortion when it's here it's 0 and right now it's reading about 0.37 or so and it's dominated by noise you can see that it's just there's some kind of harmonic distortion going on there but it's not much it's mostly noise so that means this amplifier is not clipping and it's putting out a clean signal so let's try and put this up a bit and see if we can get to that 20 watts that's written on the box you'll see the arrow on the distortion meter bouncing around as I turn the volume knob and as we get to right around six and a half volts you can see it starts to climb very high up and we get these strange peaks here on the oscilloscope that means that the amplifier is clipping and it's uh, uh, the distortion is being dominated by harmonic distortion rather than noise and uh, this pretty much means that we have reached the maximum power output that this amplifier can do into an 8 ohm load and uh, six and a half volts into 8 ohms that is somewhere between 5 and 6 watts about 5.3 or so 
and uh, 5.3 watts that's uh, nowhere near the uh, claimed 20 watts that uh, is written on the box. However, since this is a 12 volt amplifier, it could be specified for 4 ohms. So I'm going to switch the load into 4 ohm mode. I'll turn the volume down first. Now it's in 4 ohm mode, and we're putting out 3.7 volts. And when you're using a 4 ohm load, you'll have a lower voltage but a higher current flowing through your speaker. So if we turn it back up to 5 volts, we'll be putting out about twice as much power, or 6 watts, as we did into the 8 ohm load. And it's clearly do it's doing 6 watts into 4 ohms just fine, with about 0.04% THD plus N. So let's turn it up and see how much power we can get before it starts turning nasty. And there we go. We are now very slightly clipping. Um, the volume control is kind of finicky. There we go. We are right on the verge of what this power, power amplifier can do into 4 ohms. And it's right at 6 volts. Which equals about 9 watts. So that's quite a, <laughs> quite a ways shy of the advertised 20 watts. And uh, I knew that was going to happen because I have tested this amplifier before. And I'm go going to link in the more detailed measurements I did when I just got it in the description. So check those out if you're feeling a bit nerdy. I did some spectrums and things like that using computer software. So, well, the Pi, it can do 9 watts into 4 ohms and 5 watts into 8 ohms. So, does that mean anything? Do you need more than 5 watts? Do you actually need the 20 watts that's advertised on it in order to listen to music on a couple of cheapo speakers on your desk? And well, the short answer is uh, no, you don't. 5 watts is more than adequate for most uh, applications you're going to encounter, unless you want to play very loud. Oh hey, it's glitching out. There we go, much better. In general, when you just uh, listen to soft background music or something like that, you are rarely using more than a single watt of power. When I've used metered amps in my systems, I rarely give a bev above uh, 0 0.1 watts. However, if you want to turn the volume up or you want to use the tone controls, for instance, in order to boost, uh, for instance, the bass, then you're going to get a lot more power dissipated in your speakers, and that could prove to be a problem. Because while 5 watts is enough to give you music loud and clear through your speakers, it's not going to give you any kind of room to, for instance, listen to loud peaks, explosions in movies, if you turn the tone controls on. Because these tone controls, I believe they go to roughly plus minus 10 dB. And uh, when you turn this up 10 dB, you are putting out 10 times more power at the bass register, which is where most of the power in music and movies is. So even if your average listening level is only 0 0.5 watts, if you turn that up, you're going to be peaking at 5 watts at uh, the bass when that comes. But uh, if you're just going to be like me and turn the tone controls off, then that's not going to be much of a problem. So, let's hook up a couple of speakers and give it a bit of a test. I'll just try and talk to the camera and give you an estimate of how loud it actually is. Well, before we do that, let's just have a quick look at uh, the more detailed measurements I took of this amplifier right now. At 12 volts, you're going to get a maximum of 5.04 watts into the speakers without clipping, or 8.42 watts into 4 ohms. So, whether or not you have 8 or 4 ohm speakers, that depends on your speakers. You have to check that. The clipping power at 1% distortion, 
This is what I generally call the absolute maximum you want to take out of the amplifier. 1% uh, distortion is quite nasty. You can usually hear it as a scratching, horrible noise, but uh, it can be survivable. And we're at 6.23 watts and 10.56 watts for 4 ohms. Now, 10% THD plus M, that's what a lot of uh, manufacturers like to specify. And this is very hard clipping. Your music is going to sound horrible at 10% distortion. It's just going to be like uh, listening to a broken radio. And at that rating, we end up at 9.28 watts and 15.21 watts for 4 ohms. The rated pair of 20 watts uh, can be achieved at 31% THD plus N into 4 ohms. It cannot be achieved into 8 ohms with a 12 volt power supply. And at 4 ohms, we essentially get a square wave. So that's not mu that's not even music anymore. It's just some kind of noise like a jackhammer. And before we move on, I just measured the responses of the tone controls on the unit, and they are <laughs> absolutely insane. The bass control gives you 14.6 dBs of gain at 20 Hz, and 14.6 dB that is an extreme amount of gain for a tone control. It means that if your average listening level is 100 milliwatts, then if you turn the bass control to max, then your bass is going to be pushing out at 5 watts. And <laughs> that's a good thing in the way that uh, uh, you can uh, use this amplifier to essentially force bass out of almost any speaker, but uh, uh, you're going to run out of power very fast if you try and turn it up. And uh, the very low frequency of this control most bass controls are centered around 100 Hz. It means that uh, it will essentially apply gain to the very lowest sub bass for the most part, the real rumbling in the stomach type bass. And in my opinion, that's a very good thing because I don't personally like that uh, whoopy bass drum 100 Hz bass that most units have. So, depending on your opinion of how you want a bass control to work, this bass control is excellent. But turning it off, you should be careful because you could easily run the amplifier into clipping and damage your speakers. The treble control is a bit more sensible. It's 10.4 dBs maximum gain at centered at 20 kHz. That is a very high frequency for audio. It's pretty much the top frequency that most people can hear. And uh, most tone controls are centered at about 10 kHz. That's a more audible sound. But there's nothing wrong with a tone control 20 kHz, so I'd give these tone controls a thumbs up. I like them. So I've turned on some music into a couple of test speakers and we're listening at about 2 to 3 watts. And now look at what happens when I turn the bass control on. These flat spots, they are the amplifier clipping and that could be very damaging to your speakers. And if we take a look... This is our output voltage. As you can see, we're hovering at 2 to 4 volts, which is half a watt to 4 watts about. Now, if I turn the bass control up... We are trying to push the amplifier to almost 8-9 volts, which is far more than it can handle. I also noticed on my amplifier the treble control only works on the right channel, so I don't know what's up with that. It is a good sounding bass control though, I must admit I am very surprised most commercial grade amplifiers don't have this good tone controls. And for all the excursion nuts out there, this is what the Levi being driven right to the edge, it's clipping very slightly, looks on my test speakers which are 4 inch Sony speakers 
which are about 86 decibels per watt, non ported Another problem Tube Amplified Slifers could suffer from is overheating issues. So I've hooked up a 4 ohm load, I've set it to the absolute maximum power it can output cleanly, which was about 10 watts. And I'm just going to let it cook for a while. The amplifier is quite efficient, I measured it at 71% uh, efficiency. And uh, at this, these settings, it's uh, dissipating about uh, 7 watts into the amplifier, which is not a whole lot. I would reckon this amplifier will not overheat. It's been sitting now for about half an hour, and it's barely getting warm. It's performing right as it did when I started it, so this amplifier will not overheat, even on the heavy load. And for all the nerds out there, here is the clipping waveform at 10% THT. And here is the distortion waveform which seems to be made out of mostly third order harmonic distortion just as you'd expect. And let's say you were a bit drunk and didn't bother inserting the cables properly can it handle a short circuit on the output? So, the Leapi LP2028 Plus, is it any good? Uh, well, I think I've highlighted its weaknesses in this video. The build quality is not very good, the numbers on the top are bullshit, but uh, all in all, for $20 it's a very capable amplifier. And if you can uh, live with the risks of getting one like mine that doesn't really work properly and might need a bit of uh, percussive maintenance every once in a while. Well, I'd say if you're strung on cash and need a little amplifier, you can't do much better than this. It performs pretty much as well as the uh, TA2020 amplifier chip is supposed to, so if you're just looking for performance, there's really no point in getting a more expensive uh, TA2020 based amplifier. There are lots of them out there, like the I think there's one named Topping. Well, there are more of them than you can count, and performance wise, those probably won't give you a whole lot more than the Leap I. What they will give you is much higher build quality and better feel. Because my biggest grind with this thing is, aside from the blue LEDs which I have replaced, is that the feel of it is really not very good. It feels cheap and you just get what you pay for. But if you don't want to pay a lot, you'll be damn hard strung to find something better. Thanks for watching, and uh, if you want to find some more details, do check out my written review, I will link it down in the description below. And if you want to see any more measurements or things that isn't covered in there, do leave a comment and I can probably get them for you. Cheerio!